ways, the Bible of my youth was set up to fail. My early faith was shaped by the evangelical Bible church my family attended. It instilled in me a deep love and reverence for the Bible that remains with me still. Without the Bible, I wouldn't be standing here doing what I love to do. But I was taught to expect something from the Bible that I have since come to believe the Bible couldn't give me, that it never was intended to provide. I expected the Bible to be an internally consistent voice of authority that offers clear, universal answers to life's questions. My questions as a young woman, younger woman, were sometimes personal. I'd turn to the Bible with my questions like, how can I be a faithful person pleasing to God? And what is the path toward becoming a good spouse? And later, for me, a good mother. One question I asked a lot, is it wrong to be gay? I also asked the Bible questions like, do people who don't believe in Jesus really go to hell forever? Why do horrible things happen to really good people? And is it my sin that made Jesus die on the cross? I was taught that the Bible was my go-to when I had questions, a kind of owner's manual for life, basic instruction, before leaving earth. The Bible came without flaws or contradictions. It could be trusted to speak clearly and decisively on any issue up for debate, be it political, social, or personal. That seems like a long time ago. Sometimes people go to the Bible with their questions about everything from is climate change real? And how long have humans inhabited the earth? To how can I keep my marriage together? Or can the Bible alone cure depression, anxiety, addiction? Today we continue our worship series expounding on a wonderful book by Rachel Held Evans, Inspired, Slaying Giants, walking on water, and loving the Bible again. Each week, we've engaged a type of sacred theme found in the Bible, and the, congregation, uh, the conversation continues on Zoom right after worship. We'll post the link at the end, and I hope that you'll jump on. We began with origin stories, then deliverance stories. Last week was resistance stories, and today we look at wisdom stories. In the Protestant tradition, five biblical books are generally grouped together and categorized as wisdom literature. Job, Proverbs, the Psalms, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. The Bible's wisdom literature can look like short directives or poetry. It can look like a story or a monologue that goes on for chapters. And sometimes the wisdom is surprising. Like a gold ring and a pig's snout is a beautiful woman who shows no discretion. Or general guidance. If anyone loudly blesses their neighbor early in the morning, it will be taken as a curse. Sometimes wisdom literature is romantic. Your teeth are like a flock of shorn ewes that have come up from the washing. Try putting that on your valentine. Or they might be downright racy. Come, let us take our fill of love until morning. Let us delight ourselves with love. For my husband is not at home. He has gone on a long journey. Look it up, it's in there. Or as we used to say in my former life as an Episcopalian, this is the word of the Lord, thanks be to God. Now, I'm having some fun here, but most Wisdom literature is more seriously minded. The aim of wisdom literature is to uncover something true 
about the nature of reality in a way that makes the reader or listener wiser. In the Bible, wisdom literature, excuse me, wisdom is rarely presented as a single decision, belief, or rule. Wisdom is a path that must be continually discerned amid the twists and turns of life. Wisdom is not about sticking to a set of rules or hitting the bullseye that represents God's will. Wisdom is a journey that takes a lifetime. Again and again in the Bible, wisdom is presented as a way of life, a path of humility and faithfulness that we take one step at a time. Much of wisdom literature seems to say, if you live right, you will prosper. If you don't, you will suffer. It's this clear dimension of reward and punishment Do this, you'll get that desired result. And if you don't, things will not go well for you. It's a simple idea and a very common one in the Bible. Trouble pursues the sinner, but the righteous are rewarded with good things. The righteous eat to their heart's content, but the stomach of the wicked goes hungry. A little while and the wicked will be no more but the meek will inherit the land and enjoy peace and prosperity. For ancient Hebrew people, this principle of reward and punishment was established from the very beginning. God is said to have delivered the Ten Commandments to Moses. If the people followed the commandments of God, they would prosper. And it seemed to work that way. Joshua followed God's instruction and won great battles, and the walls came tumbling down. If the battles didn't go well, they chalked it up to a single soldier who had failed. They understood their history through the lens of God's reward and punishment. When something went wrong, that meant God was displeased with someone. It was because of disobedience that Saul lost his crown and that four of David's sons died and that Solomon lost his kingdom. The connection between suffering and sin remained pervasive enough in first century Jewish thought that when Jesus' disciples encountered a man blind from birth, they asked their rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents? that he was born blind. In a great many churches today, this way of thinking remains. One form it takes is prosperity theology, which claims that financial blessing and physical well-being are always the will of God, and if you live in ways that please God, then you will prosper. And if you don't prosper, it's because you're doing something wrong. The Bible says. And as we've just read, it does. But that's not all the Bible says, because then came Job. Job did everything right. He was a blameless and upright man who feared God and shunned evil. He was good to his family, kind to the poor, generous with his workers. And as a result, Job prospered. He was wealthy. He had 10 children. The principle of God's reward for the faithful came through loud and clear in Job until it didn't. According to Job's story, as it is told in the Hebrew Scriptures, Job was so virtuous and upstanding that even God noticed. God sort of brags to the divine counsel that Job would remain faithful no matter what he encountered. Side note, at that point in the evolution of our faith, a council of gods was envisioned with Yahweh as the top god. It indicates a transition from polytheism, many gods, to monotheism, one god. Remember the first commandment, I am the Lord your God, you shall have no other gods before me. It's the assumption, of course, that 
There are lots of gods, but Yahweh is at the top, the top God, the most powerful. So on this divine council is a character named Satan. No, not Satan, the devil. Satan is a generic Hebrew term that means adversary. Long story short, God bets Satan that Job would remain faithful no matter what happened to him. Satan says, I'll take that bet. And then he caused one horrible thing after another to happen to Job. Job lost his family, his business, his land, his health. Job lost everything. And Job's response takes up the next 37 chapters. Job maintains his innocence. Even though his friends tell him he deserves his suffering, Job says, I did nothing to deserve this. He speaks plainly about his pain, confusion, and disillusionment with God. And then God speaks. In this beautiful poetry, God essentially says, don't listen to your friends. I am God, you are not. Here, let me restore your prosperity. Happy ending. What then does the story of Job say about wisdom? According to Bible scholar Ellen Davis, Job's story says that the person in pain is a theologian of unique authority. The one who complains to God, pleads with God, rails at God, does not let God off the hook for a minute, she is at last admitted to a mystery. She passes through a door that only pain will open and is thus qualified to speak of God in a way that others, whom we generally call more fortunate, cannot speak. It's not only in Job that we find a flaw with reward and punishment. Throughout the Bible's wisdom literature, we find this other side of the conversation. One psalm declares, a little while and the wicked will be no more. And another asks God, how long will you defend the unjust and show partiality to the wicked? Psalm 73 laments the successes and pleasures of evil people. They are free from common human burdens. They're not plagued by human ills. Surely in vain have I kept my heart pure. Ecclesiastes just says, what are you going to do? When times are good, be happy. When times are bad, remember, God has made the one as well as the other. I remain unconvinced that God causes the good or the bad, but that's a sermon for another day. As Rachel Held Evans writes, in short, when it comes to the nature of suffering and blessing, the Bible does not speak with a single voice. Which means that whenever we hear a declaration that starts with, well, the Bible says we should be wary. We should ask questions like, where does it say that? And to whom are they speaking? In what context? What else does the Bible say? Authentic engagement with the Bible means embracing its diversity. Wisdom is situational in the Bible and in our lives. Wisdom isn't just about knowing what to say. It's also knowing when to say it. Wisdom is not only knowing what is true. It's about knowing when it is true. Just like Job, we are invited into the whirlwind to cry out and question, to demand and debate, to consider the big questions of life without resting in easy answers. As Marcus Borg said, the Bible is best understood as a primary conversation partner. The Bible reflects the complexity and diversity of the human experience. The writer of Ecclesiastes asks, where does wisdom come from and where is the place of understanding? Wisdom is not found in a single place. 
It's not about finding an answer. Wisdom is about getting on a path that will take a lifetime.